General Surgeon FICS, uh, the coordinator of this chapter, and I will be the moderator of this event. First of all, I would like uh, to express my gratitude and highly appreciate uh, to all distinguished great speakers, Professor George Sofas as the world president from Greece, and then uh, Professor Francis Podbilski, uh, thoracic and general surgeon uh, from the International College of Surgeons US section, and right. also Mr. Max uh, Downham, the world CEO of ICS uh, at the headquarters office in Chicago. Also to my colleagues, the office bearer of ICS Indonesia section, Professor Paul Tahlili, the president, uh, Professor Hendy Hendarto, the scientific vice president, uh, Dr. Johnny Dharmajaya, the organization vice president, and Dr. Franz Arifin, the secretary of the Indonesia section. Also, uh, Mr. Bimo Gumla and Ms. Devi as the IT and the management of this webinar. Also, to all participants, uh, again, welcome and hopefully we can take the productivity and the result of this uh, session and hopefully it will be very fruitful. Uh, for the first opening session, I would like to invite the president of the Indonesian section, Professor Dr. Paul Tahlili. Professor Paul Tahlili, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter, as a moderator. Good day for everybody that attend as a participant of the international virtual seminar of ICS Indonesian sections, uh, chapter six. Um, my honorable guest speaker, Professor Francis Podbelski from United States section of ICS. Professor Samsu Dayat, my senior, my teacher from Indonesian section. Um, Dr. Franz uh, Arifin, all the speakers, thank you for your participant for this seminar. And welcome, Professor George Sulfas. Yes. Is there Professor George? Is there? Yes, I'm here. Not yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. Already? Yeah. Um, yes, as a president of ICS Global. And um, Mr. Max Donham, my friend from Chicago, United States, Executive Director of ICS Global. And also ICS Indonesian Section Committee and all participants. Welcome to this International College of Surgeon Indonesian Section Virtual Seminar Forum Chapter 6. And today, next slide please. We talk about the patient safety and within the COVID-19 pandemic era, and you know that this event impact, had impact changing our lifestyle, human behavior, economic collapses, and all activities become stagnant. Until now, the trend of COVID-19 has not been decreased in several countries, especially in Indonesia. Indonesian, we have a mortality rates around 4.4% and globally 3.8%. Uh, Patient safety is an issue become a hot topic in general, but not only for the patient. Um, the other thing is medical staff also must be safety in the way they work. I hope all the speakers can elaborate how important the safety is for medical staff and patients. I pray to all participants be healthy and stay safe. Uh, have a nice virtual seminar for all audiences. 
Once again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Paul Tahlili, for your speech. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like to invite uh, the World President of the Indonesian of the International College of Surgeon, uh, Professor George Sulfas from Greece. Professor George Sulfas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. They say that um, uh, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And life has given us a very big lemon with what has happened and is happening with COVID. However, what uh, your chapter has uh, been able to do is really an example to all, not just for the International College of Surgeons, but I think for all surgical societies these lessons what is becoming a tradition here with this one being the sixth one is really one of the best ways to start adapting to our changing circumstances and these are very important um, as a way to communicate with each other but also as an educational tool for more junior surgeons and for everybody who wants to hear um, it's also very important that you have an excellent group of speakers. I see Frank Podolsky from uh, the U.S., who's an excellent speaker. And um, it's really great to have this international co collaboration. So I really congratulate you from the bottom of my heart and thank you for putting this uh, together and thanking everybody for taking the time to uh, be here. We're not going to be able to do away with COVID anytime soon, and I think it's going to change our lives for years um, to come. However, what you're doing is an example of how we can adapt and how we shall adapt, an example that all of us can learn from. So congratulations again, and looking forward to a great session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor George Sulfas. And for the next opportunity, I would like to invite the scientific vice president of ICS Indonesia Section, Professor Hendy Hendarto. Professor Hendy Hendarto, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Good evening, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining the International Surgical Forum. Chapter 6, the International College Surgeon Innovation Section. Firstly, I would like to express my deepest gratitude and appreciation to Professor Pauta Lili, Professor Podelski, Professor Samsu Hidayat, Professor Solfas, Solfas and Mr. Max, Dr. Johnny, and all participants. The webinar topic today is surgical and on patient safety. I think it's, it's very interesting for our profession. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the scientific notes, I inform that in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, almost all health society, especially Surgeon Society, recommend in term cancellation of elective surgical procedure. And now in the new normal era, after the first surge of wine, Many hospitals resume essential surgery in response to the patient need. The principle is this, hospitals should use available testing to protect staff and patient safety. And consider use telemedicine for component of the preoperative patient consultation. And prior to implementing the startup of any invasive procedure of area should be terminally clean according to evidence information. The statement I say, I just say, is the recommendation from the joint statement American College of Surgeon, American Society of Anesthesiologists, and American Hospital Association. That's all I think about the scientific notes. I hope we all stay healthy and stay safe. And finally, thank you for all the speaker and participant. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Henry Hindarto, for your speech. Uh, and now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Max Downham, the world CEO of the International College of Surgeons. 
Uh, Mr. Dowdham, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Van uh, For I have a couple of minutes uh, from, uh, from you, and I'm privileged to have that time. And so I'll make, uh, I have no slides, but I'll make three quick points. Uh, uh, and so, first of all, to Professor uh, Sufas, uh, Professor Tahalehi, and all the other wonderful persons on the webinar program, um, welcome. And I'm privileged to, to be here and to be part of this. So thank you. Um, three points. One, if you look at the uh, International College of Surgeons website, uh, the address being uh, icsglobal.org, uh, preceded by www, uh, uh, you will see, and on, uh, hopefully I, I think all of you already know, that um, the college is 85 years Eight, uh, old. Uh, Dr. Max Thorick founded the college in 1935. Uh, and the interesting point is, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, it's always been open to all nationalities, all creeds, uh, all races. Uh, we are apolitical. We are not uh, connected or lobby or do anything with national governments. And uh, in, in this era, at this time around the world, when many challenges are being encountered, some in reference to these aspects. Uh, this college, your college, uh, has, uh, has always been open uh, and uh, is not uh, uh, politically oriented in any way. So college was founded uh, in a time of adversity. It's gone through many periods of adversity, change, and I will tell you that it's stronger than ever. And it's getting better and better and will be even more stronger with each passing day. So uh, it's a wonderful organization. And uh, that's point one. Point two, as uh, Professor Sufas articulated very well, and I, I will just uh, touch on the uh, point, we have four missions in the college. One being education, uh, research, communications, leadership. And the point here, Dr. Manopo, through your great work and, uh, and the leadership, uh, Professor Tahalehi and the other leaders and, and each and every fellow in the Indonesian section, uh, you are accomplishing and addressing all, or addressing all of those four uh, missions in this webinar. And, uh, and you are to really, I think, be commended for that, uh, as Professor Sufas indicated. Uh, the example that you and the Indonesian section uh, are setting and demonstrating is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's, uh, and I can only hope, uh, along with Professor Sufas and the leadership of the, of the college, the global leadership, uh, that uh, other sections will emulate this, will not necessarily in the same manner, but uh, they can do it their own way. Uh, so that's point two. Uh, and point three is that uh, through the superb leadership of Professor Sufas and a past world president whose name is Dr. Fidel Ruiz Healy, who is chair of the specialty groups within the International College of Surgeons, we're launching uh, beginning in September, a series of uh, webinar programs that are oriented uh, around the specialty groups within the International College of Surgeons. Uh, and again, uh, uh, kudos to Professor Sufas, to Dr. Rez Healy in Mexico City uh, for this initiative. It's an absolutely wonderful initiative uh, addressing all of the four missions. Uh, the first one will be September 26, uh, with the topic being uh, global humanitarian surgery. So Dr. Manopo, Professor Tahalehi, all of the other leaders and gentlemen and, and ladies on this program, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Minister Donham, for your remarks. And uh, for the last opening session, I would like to invite Dr. Franz Arifin to deliver the business issues of the section. Uh, Dr. Franz Arifin, the floor is yours. Please unmute your microphone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Manopo. Uh, so I would like uh, to uh, take this moment as the secretary of in the ICS Indonesian section to announce the are actually to in, uh, 
repeat what uh, Max has mentioned that uh, the International uh, College of Surgeons has the uh, grand rounds. We call it the surgical grand rounds. I think I can share the screen right now, just a moment. So, so uh, this is the announcement. So in uh, September, uh, the 26th of September, the 2020, uh, there will be a surgical grand rounds of the ICS uh, International, and there will be uh, uh, five, uh, four topics, which is the ICS and global surgery, ICS and the WHO, ICS, uh, current status of the global surgery initiative in the ICS, and the future challenges and goals for the ICS and the global humanitarian surgery. Uh, each will be presented by uh, our uh, honorable uh, members, uh, presidents and past world presidents and uh, uh, president Alec of the uh, International College of Surgeons. I think that will be all, uh, Dr. Peter, for the uh, business session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pras uh, for your uh, announcement. And now we come to the scientific session that will uh, be started by Professor Samsu Hidayat that will deliver his presentation on the ethics and surgery. And then the second session will be by Professor Francis Potpilski and the last will be by Dr. Franciscus Arifin. So I would like to invite Professor Samsu Hidayat to deliver your presentation. The floor, the floor is yours. Professor Samsu Hidayat, the, the floor is yours. Please unmute your microphone, please. Mr. Bimo, please unmute the microphone of Professor Samsu Hidayat. Oh, yeah, it's now. Okay. All yeah. right. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Oh, that's me. <laughs> My photograph earlier last year. I'm now looking quite older than that. So you can see my face when I present. Yes. My name is Samsu Hidayat, and my friends call me just Sam. My surname is Rono Kusumo. That's my father, grandfather's name. Uh, I was born in 1931. I'm now 88 years, and uh, I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Indonesia in Jakarta, uh, Emeritus. And I have performed surgery for 52 years, starting in 1959. And I stopped doing surgery at all, 2011. I'm a member of several research ethics committees. Yes. My talk will roughly consist of three parts. First is the history of surgical ethics. Next is the development of surgical ethics. And lastly, I will talk about a few slides on, on surgical ethics today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's about the history. I'm very, very quick. I'm just going by my slide because I try to be in good time to end this talk. The origin of surgical ethics has been ambiguous. Yes, it's not quite clear how it started and where and when. Some claim it, it, it dates back to the ancient Greeks. It's very old. Next slide. Although medical and surgical ethics are common fundamental principles, surgical ethics, surgical ethics evolved distinctly at, the, at last from medical ethics properly due to the unique nature of surgery and surgeon to patient relationship. Uh, that's what I feel for more than 50 years, surgeon and patient relationship. Uh, I can just can go to the next slide, please. 
as the field of surgery continues to advance, society will rely on surgeons to guide the future of surgical ethics to ensure that they upheld uh, that. Pardon? I cannot see the slide. That trust is always upheld and the focus remains on the patient. The focus remains on the patient. Next, please. I try to go by my slide because the time is short, yes. The development of surgical ethics. As surgery grew to become a respected medical profession, it was formerly not a respected surgical profession. It started with, uh, with an art, yeah? empiric art, and slowly it becomes a scientific discipline. Medical profession in the 18th century, medical ethics emerged as a response to the growing need to protect patients and maintain the public trust in physicians and in surgeons, of course. Next, please. Uh, I just skip on this now because I will come back later on John Gregory. Although the Hippocratic, now I'm going back to Hippocratic writers and joint physician to do no harm, that is the first Hippocratic oath centers doing no harm. Modern medical ethics as a specific subject to be pondered over dates from the writings of two British physicians, like I mentioned before, and they are Gregory and Parsifal in the 18th century. They both recognized the use, the need of physicians to remain knowledgeable first and keep always competent while at all times placing the patient's welfare above their own interest. That's the surgical pledge, or of, of course, if this is pledge, a physician oath is like that, the Hippocratic oath, yes. Next. The second part of the 19th century, oh, it's a very important part for surgeons, the modern surgical advances of anesthesia 1915s by Morton and antisepsis. Antisepsis. And uh, Professor Samsu Hidayat, we cannot hear your voice. Oh, okay. Now, yeah. can yeah. you? Yeah. In the second part of the 19th century, beginning in 1850 or 1849, the modern surgical advances in anesthesia by Morton in, in 1949, 1950. Professor Samsu Hidayat, any trouble yes. with your microphone? No, it's always okay. on mute. Yeah. Right, can I go on? Yes. Yes. We are always concerned the need for a discipline of ethics specific to surgery in order to confront new and evolving ethical issues. That comes after mid 19th century. 1850 was exactly the start of Morton for anesthesia, Robert Koch for bacteriology and antisepsis, and then comes the blood groups, the blood groups, ABO by Karl Steiner in 1901, uh, exactly the start of immunology at that time. Immunology, the father of immunology is indeed, uh, indeed Karl Steiner. Where are my slides? Uh, I missed my slides. Sorry, where are they? Uh, all right, here it is. This is my next slide. One of the founding initiatives of the American College of Surgeons, go back to College of Surgeons because this is quite early. In 1913, this is the almost uh, more than 100 years ago, was to eliminate unethical 
practices such as fee splitting and itinerant surgery or that was discussed at that time already more than 100 years ago. As surgery continued to advance in the era of solid organ transplant and minimally invasive minimally invasive surgery in the latter half of the last century, surgical innovation and conflict of interest have emerged as important ethical issues moving forward into the 21st century. I repeat, conflict of interest and surgical and, and fee splitting, of course. Yeah? I don't mention fee splitting here. <coughs> Next, please. In the practice of medicine and surgery, ethically challenging issues frequently arise. Surgeons practice within a medical realm that is deeply dependent upon a meaningful physician-patient relationship in surgery as well. With an ethos, Dually emphasizing patient self-determination and physician's guidance. So those emphasizing patient self-determination and physician's guidance is now still uh, done, of course. Yeah? I have the next slide, please. With the next chapter, we aim to provide the practicing surgeon with a toolkit to assist formulating ethical questions and address them in a systematic fashion. I try to be systematic, but not quite easy. Next. Next. First. No, no, no. Just, just go back. No? Yes. First, I will present a fictional patient scenario with several ethical issues commonly encountered by surgical providers. Next. We then introduce the well-known published methods for the evaluation of ethical problem. One is, of course, the Beecham and Children's model, the principle-based ethics. Principle-based ethics, we know it. Uh, respect for autonomy or respect for person and non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice, of course. The fourth topic or four box approach is the second. I will mention it uh, later shortly. And the last is the Pellegrino approach on medical uh, morality. Pellegrino has written this article in somewhere in 1997. Uh, I may come back to it later. And apply each method to the theoretical case, of course. Beecham and Childress, the four topic approach and the Pellegrino approach. Next slide. The four topic approach is uh, practical. It's very much practical to sort out facts and values. Next. And these are the four topics. You must have a medical indication for doing something. The patient values or patient preferences should be considered as being important in making decisions and informed consent. The quality of life, even after surgery, and contextual features, other features. There are so many value systems around medicine, surgery, and the patient, of course. This provides a framework that can be used with any case. It allows the provider to approach a clinical case systematically, that's important. Integrating ethical principles and clinical circumstances. Yeah, you come to, of course, very serious ethical dilemmas here. Next. What is this about? Uh, the development of surgical ethics, yes. Surgical ethics evolves into a distinct branch of medical ethics, try to be separated from medical ethics. And the core of surgical ethics, the core of surgical ethics is the surgeon patient relationship and the surgeon's responsibility to advance and protect the well being of his patient. Those just two principles. The surgeon's responsibility to advance and to protect the well-being of the patient is much, very much important. 
in any case. Next, please. Surgeons are likely familiar with the navigation of ethical conundrums. However, frequently do so without any formal training, like I was. I don't have any formal uh, ethical training after I started doing surgery in 1959. So just by feeling perhaps, but anyhow, I feel that there must be something I have missed, of course. Next, please. Historically, the purview of theologians and philosophers, <laughs> the field of clinical medical ethics has evolved significantly since its inception in the 1970s. It really started in 1970s, early 19, 1970s, helping clinicians to practically address commonly encountered issues. Uh, that's just one common statement. Uh, can I have a drink plus because dry throat. Uh, Max, I know you're watching. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, next, please. Now, this is a book that is available online earlier last year, Surgical Ethics, the Principles and Practice by Ferreris. And the authors are, no, do, do, do names. I, 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 I'm not familiar with both names, but anyhow, I have the book. Uh, <laughs> And very short story about this book, if I may. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, go back. One slide back. No, yeah. The history of medical ethics in the West begins mm -hmm. before the term was coined in 1803 by Percival and uh, Gregory, and ending with today's notion of bioethics. This is a slowly developing uh, history in medical ethics in the West. We try to be uh, following what is developing in the West because medicine and surgery comes together with medicine coming from the West. We are applying now here Western medicine, not traditional local uh, medicine or local wisdom then. Next, please. There are some keys of conflict. Now this must be start to be important. And historical shift, historical shift that happens around three centuries, transforming medical ethics from an unnamed and amorphous idea to a distinctive field of study informing patient care. This historical shift is around two or three centuries long. Uh, that is what I have learned from history. Next, please. The path is complex with medical advances and medical pitfalls over the centuries, two or three centuries, that both compel and inhibit progress. It compel progress and it also inhibit progress. With each historical shift, distinguishing features arise. So the historical shift is uh, quite an important period in development of ethics in medicine as well as in surgery. Can I have the next, please? Medical ethics, medical ethics first takes place, takes shapes in oaths or faith and loyalty, where the virtues and moral obligations of physicians were grounded in the dictates of the gods, the state, the crown and also the church. So that was the beginning. Uh, 
I still remember a lecture by by uh, who, who was the Pope, the, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, a lecture delivered by Pope Benedict in a city near München. Uh, what's the the city is Regensburg, University of Regensburg. That's where he comes from, and the title of the lecture is Faith, Reason, and the University. That's uh, quite an interesting lecture. I like those lectures. I read it repeatedly. And at that meeting in 2006, I think it was in September 2006, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth mentioned uh, comes also together with all other uh, representatives for the great religions like uh, Buddhism, uh, Hindu, and and Islam, apart from Christian and Catholics. That was in 2006 in Regensburg. Next, please. Over the course of the 16th to the 19th century, that is 300 years, the historical shift, this oath come to the to be defined by an emerging practice of medicine. The practice of medicine tried to emerge during those centuries. Actually, medicine becomes a scientific discipline after 1815, something that. Before that, it's still uh, both whether it is uh, scientific or non-scientific, but tried to develop it after the 1850s. With the uh, with the discovery of ether as an anesthesia drug by Morton in 1850. Next, as such, the power of the oath comes from the professional contract rather than. Am I correct? I lost my slide. Where are the slides? Slides are Ilan. Hello. Yeah, uh, the slides is oh, still yeah. on the screen. It's still there, still on, yeah. Yeah. It comes from the professional contractors than those higher authorities. So the professionals are doing their own job, creating uh, the ethics rather than abiding to whatever the higher authorities is saying. The next, please. Next slide, please. Little has changed, even so, in the named virtues. The named virtues are fidelity, beneficence, compassion, and integrity. And their moral standing continue to be founded on social consensus rather than on moral argument. That is what I found in the literature to read. Finally, to the struggles and failures of scientific progress in the 19th century and 20th century, there is an urgent demand for the moral reasoning and rigorous justification that comes to define ethics as we know it today. So I repeat again, through the struggles and failures of scientific progress. So science is coming into discussion about how Finally, the ethics should be. Right? Next. Masih ada slide saya? Uh, surgical ethics has to do with the determination of what ought to be done, all things considered. That is what I feel. This is my own words, I think. Yeah? Not from, from anywhere. As I experienced myself during my 50 years of doing surgery, in my country. Maybe I will have a few more slides, please. Thank you. Yes. The prompt reflection of eight analytical questions are, I don't think I need to read this question. I will finish my talk here and hopefully this will contribute something into this forum. Thank you very much. You can uh, have it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Samsu Hidayat, for your informative presentation. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like uh, to invite 
Professor Francis Potpilski, uh, a thoracic surgeon and yeah, general surgeon from International College of Surgeon U.S. Section. Uh, Professor Potpilski will speak about infected port or cut leading to subpectoral and sternomanubrial abscess. Professor Potpilski, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Everyone hearing all right? Yes. Greetings from, greetings from Chicago. I'd like to uh, thank my previous speaker for a wonderful reflection on uh, the development of surgical ethics, which one can spend an entire lifetime studying. So a wonderful presentation. I'd like to start off by thanking the Indonesian section for their interest and enthusiasm and ingenuity in uh, setting up this lecture series. As we all know, COVID has really thrown a, a substantial uh, wrench into all of our practice and our interactions with one another as, as fellows. And as I look at the bottom of the screen, I see that there's 160 participants. So my hat is off to uh, Professor Minopo and Tahalele for uh, putting this together. So as we move from the realm of the theoretical and ethics, we, we really are now gonna drill down on a case that I thought brought home uh, patient safety. Uh, and patient safety is something that, you know, as much as institutions try to, try to create mechanisms to make sure that patients receive safe care, at the end of the day, patient safety is the responsibility of us as, as surgeons. It's a commitment that we make to every patient that we operate on, that they're just not the next case or you know, the next procedure we can bill for or the next something in a busy day. This is a personal commitment you make from your heart when you deliver care to someone. So I'm gonna talk about uh, a simple procedure uh, that really went horribly wrong because it was treated as just a simple procedure and people just kind of forgot about the potential complications that can occur. So we can go to the next slide, please. So just to start, I have no conflicts of, of interest in this talk. Uh, safety issues are at the forefront of delivering not only cost-effective, but safe patient care. And common procedures are often taken for granted. Uh, the surgeon comes in, your mind is on autopilot, you just do the procedure and, and kind of move on and forgot what you did during the day. So I'm gonna talk about a simple procedure like putting in a porta cath for someone. Uh, it's estimated that there's over 300,000 of these simple procedures uh, that are performed a year uh, in the United States alone, mainly for chemotherapy, but sometimes just for long-term IV access for antibiotics or for nutrition. And initially, because now, although I'm still young, or I consider myself young, I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. Uh, these procedures were initially in the realm of the operative surgeon. Uh, you came to saw the surgeon, you went to the operating room, had the procedure done, and then the surgeon would follow you at least for a while to make sure that the catheter was functioning properly. And then the patient basically disappeared off your radar screen until they would be referred back to you, hopefully being cured of their cancer to have the port removed. So now almost 30 to 40% of these procedures are performed in the radiology suite or somewhere outside of the operating room by non-surgeons. Next slide. So this patient uh, was referred to me. He's a 59 year old man with a history of metastatic prostate cancer who was undergoing chemotherapy via a right subclavian porta cath uh, that was placed by the Interventional Radiology Service. And he was uh, seen then after he developed an issue with the port under his uh, clavicle, uh, he was referred back to the radiology service and they you know, noted that this was a problem and infected and took the catheter out and packed it and said, you know, go follow up with your primary care physician. Uh, so next slide. 
So the patient did well initially, uh, but then after about six weeks, when the uh, subclavian wound had healed up just fine, he started to develop fullness and pain that worsened with movement over the right uh, sternomanubrial joint in the area of the cartilage. So he went to the emergency department and on presentation, he had a normal white count, was afebrile, uh, but had a, a raised lump and fluctuant area at the junction between the sternum and the manubrium just to the right side, actually with a, with a streak of red tracing from the porticath insertion site under the clavicle uh, to this area. The port site itself seemed to be healed well, uh, but as you got closer to the sternomanubrial joint, he had increased pain. Next slide. So they did the obligatory CT scan, which uh, all you have to do is cough or sneeze in the United States and go to the emergency room and you end up with the CT scan of the chest. And as you can see from the CT scan, there's a, a fluctuant complex mass uh, that appears to have uh, a bit of destruction of the sternal table, as well as the cartilage uh, to the right side uh, in the chest itself. Next slide. So we still don't get to the surgical service yet, uh, which is what we've been relegated to, you know, just the emergency people at the last minute. So they consulted infectious disease and they recommended conservative management. Just give the patient empiric IV vancomycin, which was then after a couple of days kind of de-escalated to sefazolin. And they did an abscess, uh, an aspirate of the abscess that grew methicillin uh, sensitive Staph aureus. After five days of this antibiotic treatment, however, while the redness had subsided a little bit, he still had a fluctuant mass and no sign of resolution. Next slide. So at this point, uh, the surgical service after the patient had been in the hospital for a week was consulted and we kind of looked at the patient's chest and determined that, you know, there was a problem with the port that it most likely tracked to the sternum. And there, based on the CT scan, was a significant destruction of cartilage and uh, a subcutaneous abscess formation. Uh, we didn't think there was any destruction of the bony sternum. However, given the debris present uh, in the deep tissue, uh, we didn't think this was going to be something that was going to be amenable to a percutaneous drain or, or simply an incision and drainage at the bedside. Uh, so we took the patient to the operating room and uh, performed incision drainage and debridement of this space. Next slide. So here you can see kind of a side view of the patient before we operated. You can see the raised lump over the uh, chest on the right side. Uh, that's not the nipple, that's actually uh, a raised area of about three to four centimeters. Uh, next slide. And here you can see after we completed the, uh, the initial debridement, uh, and there'll be another slide that'll show you things a little bit better, you can see on the right subclavian area where there's an S-scar over where the port was previously at, which seemed to be healed well, there was no fluctuance or drainage from it. Uh, the red streak that I had described to you uh, tracking from the sub, uh, subclavian area to the uh, sternal wound had resolved with the antibiotics, but you know we were left with uh, a somewhat deep hole uh, that extended alongside the sternal table after we had removed the cartilage. Next slide. Uh, so after the initial drainage, the patient uh, we took back to the operating room every, uh, every third day uh, for a uh, wound washout with a Pulsivax device and further debridement of mainly the cartilage and a little bit of bone on the sternum and a little bit of bone on the sternal head. Uh, we used a curette and bovicautery to uh, get rid of the, uh, uh, the devitalized cartilage. Uh, and then each time we packed the patient with uh, silvidine impregnated gauze. Uh, at the fourth go around of this operation, uh, we saw a healthy granulation tissue. Now this is after a week and a half and four surgical procedures to clean this out uh, that appeared to be, uh, to be forming. Next slide. 
So here you can see the wound at the, at the time of the last washout and debridement. Uh, you can just see at the far end, uh, you can see the edge of the sternum. And in the foreground, you can see where the uh, maneuverable space was at. Next slide. And uh, you can see the, uh, on the right side, you can see the char from the debridement of the sternum. And right in the middle, you can see where the cartilaginous uh, piece was at bridging the gap between the sternum <laughs> and the rib head uh, that's been resected, but otherwise with a bed of nice, healthy granulation tissue. Next slide. And this is just the packing that we used with the sylvidine. During the debridements, we had uh, had a discussion amongst ourselves is this something we should just pack and close primarily, or should we consider putting a, uh, a wound vac in? And because of the divitalized tissue and the risk for osteomyelitis, uh, we elected not just to relegate this to a wound care service with a, uh, with a wound vac, but instead uh, really aggressively make sure that this wasn't progressing with uh, additional destruction of the uh, sternum or maneuverum. Next slide. So after the fourth uh, go around and placement uh, of a uh, Jackson Pratt drain and closure of the wound, uh, the patient had a PIP line placed with uh, an additional eight weeks of cefazolin to treat this methicillin sensitive uh, Staph aureus. And we followed up uh, with the patient uh, every two weeks uh, to watch the wound to make sure that uh, the edges were coming together eventually to get the wound drain out and uh, after about six weeks or so, uh, the Jackson Pratt drain was removed, the PIP line was removed, and the patient appeared to be uh, healed. Next slide. So here's a picture of the wound at approximately uh, two months after the surgical procedure. You can still see a little eschar over the porticat site uh, with uh, nice healthy uh, tissue in the midline. Next slide. And this is six months after the, uh, after the catheter had been removed. You know, both wounds are, are healed completely. Next slide. So if you do look at the literature of this, you know, sternomanubrial and subpectoral abscesses are very rarely described in the uh, surgical literature. Uh, but those that are described, if diagnosis and treatment is not initiated promptly, uh, a soft tissue abscess can cause extremely severe complications like systemic sepsis, uh, mediastinitis, and rarely death. Uh, the essential pathology of this is uh, drainage of bacteria through the lymphatic vessels from the primary focus to the uh, uh, internal thoracic chain of lymph nodes. Uh, tissue fluctuance, which we had in this uh, case, is regarded as a late, uh, late sign of this uh, syndrome. Uh, early incision and drainage uh, is the treatment of choice. And in patients who have delayed treatment, uh, a wider drainage and debridement of devitalized tissue is, uh, is necessary. Next slide. And this is just kind of a schematic that you can see the lymphatic drainage in this, uh, in this uh, illustration uh, from the subclavian area towards the internal thoracic uh, lymph node chain. Next slide. So to summarize, uh, subpectoral abscesses are mainly described in the literature in association with some type of injury to the upper extremity. Well, this patient really has no, no specific trauma. Uh, they did have uh, a, an iatrogenic uh, trauma from an infected porticath, which was most likely the primary focus, uh, which caused this abscess. And due to the unfamiliarity of this, you know, when the interventional radiologist saw it, when the infectious disease service saw it, when the internal medicine service saw it, they really didn't know what they were looking at. And probably explained why, you know, the patient had a prolonged course of conservative management 
rather than being referred immediately uh, to the surgery service. Uh, next slide. So in summary, surgery is usually the last uh, resort uh, for uh, this process, uh, hopefully to prevent excessive tissue destruction. And it's really critical that uh, the diagnosis is made in a timely fashion. And you can ask, well, how would we have potentially done it different as surgeons? And I think what would have happened is if we had had an infected porticat uh, pocket in the subclavian area, we would have most likely not only taken the port out, but probably washed it out, packed it, saw the patient back in the office in a week or so, put the patient empirically on antibiotics, and then seen the patient a number of times to ensure that this, this catheter site infection had completely resolved. But in the era now of, uh, with interventional radiology, interventional pulmonology, and other services that are strictly uh, strictly uh, procedurally driven, you know, it becomes the main focus is doing the procedure and then referring the patient back to whoever the referring physician is in the hope that they're going to be able to manage whatever complications are. So to tie this back to the whole idea of patient safety and our ethical obligation as surgeons to our patients, uh, as complex or as simple as the procedures are that we perform on patients, it's critical that we remember we have an ethical obligation to our patients, whether simple or complex, to ensure that the procedure is done properly, safely, and that the patient has an excellent outcome, not just most of the time, but every time. So with that, uh, I would like to thank the Indonesia section for the opportunity to present. And if we could go to the next slide. Here's the references if you'd like. <laughs> And then the final slide uh, to express my, my warm feelings towards the Indonesia section, uh, I was privileged to be invited to their 2015 meeting in uh, Surabaya, and I expend my, uh, my warmest wishes uh, to all of them for, for health and continued prosperity. So uh, from Chicago, I say thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Podpilski, for your nice presentation and also for the uh, some uh, picture. <laughs> it's a good memory, unforgettable. It's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> thing. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like to invite Dr. Franz Arifin. Uh, he is a digestive surgeon and will speak about gut microbiome role in GI tract surgery. Dr. Franz Arifin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. Uh, um, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, so my topic is about the gut microbiome. And uh, as I am a digestive tract surgery surgeon, uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to discuss about the roles of the gut microbiome on the complications of uh, digestive uh, sur surgical operations. So this is the outline of my presentation. The first I will introduce uh, about the gut microbiome and how we study the gut microbiome and uh, our uh, future uh, how do you call it? Uh, how do you, uh, what will be our future in the study of microbiome and surgery? And the second part will be the classifications of complications in GI tract surgery. And the third part will be how the gut microbiome influences the complications in uh, uh, surgery. So we know that uh, GI tract bacteria plays an important role in metabolic disease. It is something that is uh, already been known for a couple of years. For example, we know that Helicobacter pylori is a microbe which, influ which influences the development of peptic ulcers in the uh, stomach and in duodenum. But we haven't, have not found a way to study the complete microbiome in the gut uh, of the human because the limitations of the method that we have uh, previously. 
Now we have a newer method, which is we can sequence all of the genome of the microbes and do not rely only on the culture of the microbes. Because if you rely on the culture of the microbes, only microbes which, is, uh, which can grow in the culture, uh, we can study. But uh, with uh, using the next gene sequencing, we can study all the uh, microbes uh, by detecting the 16 RNA uh, uh, DNA part of the uh, microbes. So we know that our gut contains approximately about 100 trillion bacteria. This is not including uh, viruses and uh, fungi. So in this sense, uh, we know, we understand that the microbes will have a major role in the uh, surgical diseases, especially if we do procedures in the digestive tract. Uh, digestive tract surgery usually operates on uh, cancer. Uh, of course, uh, and benign disease is also included. But on cancer surgery, we recognize that if we understand the biology of the disease, then we will uh, be better uh, suited to uh, manage the disease because it is uh, useless to have a good or a very sophisticated technical maneuvers, but the patient does not survive the surgery. So we will have to understand what is the role of the whole uh, metabolism and physiology of the uh, uh, gut uh, in order to be as safe as possible uh, for the patients. Uh, we know uh, on previous study that the manipulation of GI tract will influence the gut microbes and vice versa. So the gut microbes will influence also the results of our surgery. We will start with the first part. What is a negative outcome? What is the complications? Is every negative outcome in surgery is a complications? Uh, this uh, one of a good paper, which is uh, presented uh, uh, about maybe five or six years ago, mentioned uh, classification of negative outcomes. The first part, the first is uh, complications, which is uh, something that we do not expect to have. Another negative outcome is a sequel. A sequel is something that happens, but we predict that it will happen or it, will, it is possible to happen due to the progress or due to the uh, uh, development or natural history of the disease. And the third part is the failure to cure. Uh, this is when we do an operation uh, but uh, the disease is still there and we haven't uh, changed any of the pr progression of the disease. So uh, in a sense, a negative outcome does not always uh, uh, means it is a complication. This is a Clavian Dindo classification for uh, uh, complications in surgery. So we have five grades of complications. First is uh, any deviation from the normal post-operative course without the need of pharmacological treatment or surgical intervention. Grade two will require a pharmacological, pharmacological treatment with drugs. And grade three will require a surgical endoscopic and or radiological intervention, which means that if you want to manage or we want the patient to recover fully, uh, you do. You have to have this intervention for the patients. The grade four is a life-threatening complications, which is usually uh, involving sepsis. And grade five is the death of the patient. So we in the GI tract surgery, we do uh, we use the Clavian Dindo classification uh, because most of the surgery will be will have a systemic impact for the patient. Now. The, parts, the second part will be the microbiome roles in the surgical complications. These are the complications that usually we encounter as surgeons. First, hemostasis and bleeding. We understand that 
the fecal microbiota transplant is a, uh, is a procedure which we trans transplant uh, some of the microbes or uh, from a healthy patient or a healthy donor to the uh, uh, patient with the disease. And it is shown that this FMT delayed the onset of uh, thrombosis and thrombin generations in the metabolic syndrome patients. And another example is uh, the microbiota composition uh, have shown that it has reduced the metabolic syndrome on the other patient and has an effect on coagulation pathways. For the other example is the germ-free mice, which have a low prothrombin level. This is are prone to hemorrhage. And we have shown that the germ-free mice and toll like receptor 2, TLR2, is deficient, uh, uh, in deficient mice, had a lower plasma level of the von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor is something, is a protein which inhibits the uh, 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 thrombosis. And if it is uh, very low, uh, the, uh, the thrombus level will be uh, lower. So in, in, uh, in patients with uh, this dysbiosis of the gut microbiota, there is two ways that coagul coagulopathy will happen. First is the rapid degradation of the factor VIII due to the lack of von Willebrand factors. And the second way is the inactivation of the vitamin K dependent factors of coagulation, which is factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. So it means that if we have less uh, uh, variation of microbes, which produces vitamin K, the patient will have coagulopathy. The second complication is the post-operative infection. In a study done by uh, Liu et al. in 2011, they mentioned that the colorectal surgical patients have a reduced microbial diversity, including bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, but they have increased Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas, Clostridium, and Staphylococcus and Candida. Uh, these microbes are commonly found in surgical infections. So if we have an increase of uh, infection uh, causing bacteria, then we will have a higher risk of having a surgical uh, site infection. This basis of gut microbiomes uh, from a, a diverse pattern to a single pattern and then to a de depleted pattern will result in bacteriemia and subsequently to sepsis. And another study by Smith et al. in 2019 shows that pancreatic surgery patients have a subgroup, a subgroup uh, with a microbiome dysbiosis have a higher risk of a higher uh, C-reactive protein, it's a marker of inflammation, leukocytosis, and a prolonged hospital stay. Another study about the wound complication or surgical site infection is a study on my, uh, mechanical bowel preparations. Uh, classically, in the uh, uh, GI tract, especially lower GI tract surgery, we do a mechanical bowel preparations, which we cleanse the bowel. But the study done by uh, WHO and To et al. at 2018 shows that if you have a mechanical bowel preparation only without an oral antibiotic, then this, the risk of surgical site infection is higher. Another study, a meta-analysis in Lancet, shows that there is no benefit of using a mechanical bowel preparation <clears throat> even with antibiotics on colectomy patients. So this is not resolved yet. So we don't know whether it is better to do a mechanical bowel preparations or mechanical bowel preparations with antibiotic or do not prepare the bowel at all. The second uh, study uh, shows that if we reduce the number of uh, bacteria that degrade mucin, then the healing will be better. This is done by Ho et al. in 2020. It's a very new study. When you apply a povidone iodine at the margin of an anastomotic site, then it may contribute to the less anastomotic leak and improve healing. 
we will discuss about anastomotic leak uh, uh, in the details later. The other complication is post-operative ileus. This is another uh, problem that we, uh, surgeon face. The patient does not uh, uh, progress well after uh, surgery. They have a problem in uh, passing the gas and passing the uh, uh, bowel content. A study by, uh, performed by the Maya Clinic after colorectal uh, resection, patient with a post-operative ileus shows that they have a different microbiome compared with the group that did not have the POI, even after accounting for diversion stoma. And the group that developed ileus actually have an increased abundance of uh, Bacteroides spp uh, species, Parabacteroides and Romanococcus, which is associated with inflammation and carcinogenesis. So we see that in this uh, post-operative uh, problem, uh, patients with uh, uh, different type of microbes in their colon will have a different complication. Uh, this is a very uh, important uh, consideration because we digestive surgeons usually have many operations that includes the uh, anastomosis of the bowel. Now, anastomotic leak is some is a complications that is uh, dreaded by uh, GI surgeons because it has a high mortality rate and uh, may have uh, may kill the patients. Now we see that. In the patient with anastomotic leak, there are a number of bacteria that is increased, which is the lactospirase and the bacteriodicae. And the reduction of microbial diversity is contributing to the anastomotic leak. The inoculation of the anastomotic site with a Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this is a very familiar uh, sepsis related or sepsis causing uh, bacteria and uh, uh, with the high cholagenesis activity has a significantly high leakage rate. So uh, in summary that the change of bacteria and the type of bacteria on the anastomotic site will uh, ha have a correlation with the leak of the anastomosis. There are four proposed mechanisms that is uh, uh, involved in the anastomotic leak. First is that the surgical stress and the tissue damage may change the local microbiome population and phenotype. So the number and the type of microbiome is changed by the resection or by our procedures. The second one is that the local inflammatory response due to the reduced diversity and selective pressure of the pathogenic microorganism. So if we clean the bowel, we may reduce the beneficial bacteria, which is and increase the non-beneficial bacteria. So it may contribute to the leak of the anastomosis because there is a change of diversity of the bacteria on the anastomotic side. And uh, the, the third mechanism is the enzymatic breakdown of the collagen by the collagenases producing strain. So uh, bacteria in our colon usually have a very uh, a, a balancing, which we call it a uh, 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 biosis. So it's a it's not uh, it's it's already in a balance. If we do a procedure, then there's a possibility that we interrupt the balance and create another or induce the growth of uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria. And the fourth mechanism is the degradation of protective mucin due to microbial dysbiosis. So all of these four mechanisms contribute the way that the uh, microbial community uh, uh, cause the anastomotic leak. So we know that the microbiome regulates immune response. This is how they do it. It includes how the gut microbiota interacts with the epithelial tissue of the gut and then induces the macrophage to uh, 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 release the interleukin-1 and TNF uh, 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 cytokine. And then this creates a proliferation of epithelial cells and genetic mutations and chronic inflammation. The other way is that there is a, a effect 
uh, sorry, effect of probiotics on the microbiota of the colon. Uh, in this sense, that the probiotics <coughs> creates the microbiotes, uh, uh, creates the balance of microbiota and immunomodulation. This is one of the study that is done uh, in 2018 that shows that the Fusobacterium nucleatum in the tumor patient with cancer, in the bowel cancer, it has the higher rate of a deficient uh, mismatch repair gene, uh, uh, DMMR, which shows that in the patient with the Fusobacterium nucleatum bacteria have the different type of uh, 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 two more biomarkers. So we see that uh, cancer patient have different type of microbiome in their gut. Uh, the last part is about bari bariatric surgery. We know that bariatric surgery is something that change the way we digest food. And there are various studies that shows that after bariatric surgery, there are changes in gut, gut microbiota. This may be mediated by the, the change in bile acid cycle and the bile acid metabolism is altered by the gastric bypass and, uh, and, and in terms that the, then in turn the bile acid will modulate the type of microbiota in the gut. We know that the bile acid is important and it is also change in patient post cholecystectomy. So these are the three the three common uh, uh, way of doing bariatric surgery. First is the gastric uh, sleeve gastrectomy, which we cut, we cut the uh, uh, corpus of the gaster. So the, the volume of the gaster will be reduced. Or B and C is the gastric bypass procedure, which we bypass the uh, duodenum and the uh, 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 first part of the jejunum. So, in conclusion, the gut microbiome plays an important role in uh, gastrointestinal surgery, especially in modulating surgical complications. It is important to consider, the, to reconsider the current practice of surgery in the light of findings in the microbiome study, so we can uh, reduce further the complications and increase the patient safety uh, of our surgical patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Franz Arifin, for your informative presentation. And, uh, so we come to the discussion session. I would like to provide the first opportunity uh, to the discussion between the speakers. So uh, these three speakers could ask questions each other uh, to regarding to the topic they have uh, made the presentation. And afterwards, I will open the discussion uh, for the floor. So uh, for the first opportunity, uh, who of the speakers would like to ask question to the other speakers? Maybe the first opportunity I will give to Professor Samsu Hidayat. Do you have any question to the other speakers, Professor Samsu Hidayat? Yeah, just, just a simple statement. And maybe uh, how uh, Franz Arifin thinks about it. Uh, the microbiome is part of, or I may be say like this, no. Uh, the immunity or the state of immunity, the immune status of an individual is also uh, decided by the kind of bacteria in the bowel. So a sterile bowel, like you mentioned in your talk, in mice will cause that the mice will have no immunity at all. So is, is it correct that microbiome has to do with immune state? the state of immunity of an individual. Because this is the only place where bacteria comes into the body normally, into the bowel. 
Is my statement correct, Dr. Dr. Yes. Arifin? Yes, Professor Samsu Hidayat. Yes, it is very correct. So, uh, uh, in but in the bowel, we uh, our immune uh, cells uh, have a very uh, intimate contact with uh, with bacteria and pathogen and uh, antigens. So. In a sense, in a whole, uh, if we consider the whole uh, immune, immune system of the human body, this is the part that uh, the gut is the part that our immune cells uh, are trained. So they are trained to recognize whether this is a pathogen, whether this is uh, something that is beneficial, or whether this is something that uh, you have to fight for. Uh, we have a study in the rats which we sterilize uh, the bowels. This is called the gonotobiotic rats. Then uh, they have no microbiome in, the, in, the, in, the, in their uh, gut. And it, uh, they have a shorter lifespan because of the infection. So they, their immune system has no training at all. It's like a very uh, nascent uh, immune system. It's like a they have no idea about the pathogen and uh, they are very prone to autoimmune diseases because they cannot differentiate the uh, whether this is the self or the non-self. So in a sense, uh, the gut and their microbiome is a school for our immune system. So you are very correct, Prof. Samsu. Yes, my second statement or my second question is, if so, then we can uh, profit from the uh, kind of bacteria available in, in anyone's faces that has a very good immune status. I mean, you can take a few sample of his feces, put it in a capsule, and give it to someone that has a lower immune status or is fighting with his immune status because of the microbiome and his microbiome in this in his gut mm -hmm. is not quite uh, not quite uh, supporting the the immunity or the immune status of an individual. Yes. Can you do that or is, is uh, this a? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it it is something that has been done, Professor. So uh, actually. Uh, uh, for the uh, uh, we have a, a trial on mice. We have not uh, tried on uh, people with a, a poor immune immune system, but we have transplanted the wow. microbiome from healthy mice to the mice that we have no microbiome at all, and then their immune system will boost up. It recovers. So. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, human study, it is uh, yet to be done because some ethical problems. But uh, fecal microbiome transplant has been done for the patient uh, with Clostridium difficile uh, diseases. Difficile, so, oh yeah. yeah. So a patient with Clostridium difficile usually are already on a very high level of antibiotics. They have uh, killed almost all of the beneficial uh, uh, bac bacteria in the guts. And then uh, this patient usually goes to a repeated uh, cycle of antibiotics and then they uh, get, again get the colonization of Clostridium difficile. So in this patient, the fecal microbiome transplant has been done and it shows that it is better than only giving uh, antibiotics. So we take the, the microbiome from healthy individuals and transplant it to the uh, uh, patient with Clostridium difficile uh, infection. But of course, uh, the problem is that we cannot make it pill, Professor. <laughs> so uh, the microbiome will be dead before they reach the column. So in microbiome transplant, we use uh, transplantation directly to the column. Why not? Because you, you can it, do it by mouth, but it will protect it from the gastric acid. Yeah, it's a very quite difficult because we have to have all the microbiome uh, in a, a abundant in the number in a sufficient number. Uh, if you go, go by mouth, 
then uh, it will be reduced by the acids and then it will be digested by the uh, uh, bile acids in the small intestine and after they reach the colon it will be in a very small amount if is there a way is there a way to protect <laughs> As, uh, now, now, now we haven't. It's a very uh, interesting question. We haven't have found a way to protect it, uh, to protect the microbiome, so that they will reach the colon in a uh, 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 number enough, enough number. So uh, for now, <laughs> for now, we transplant it directly from. Uh, 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 we get the microbiome. We uh, colonate the microbiome from the healthy patient, and then we put it in the colon using uh, colonoscopy uh, procedures. Ah, so, thank you. Yeah, thank it's, you. It's, thank it's you, important. Professor Sabsu and Dr. Franz. Yes. For the next opportunity, I would uh, like uh, to invite Professor Potbilski. Maybe you have a question to the other speakers. Well, I think I have more of a, more of a comment to uh, Professor Arfin. You know, the, the gut the gut biology with a, a knowledge by the GI tract of what's foreign versus non-foreign, I think drives an interesting discussion about what we're all faced with with COVID at the moment, with coronavirus, because you have, you have this spectrum of people who've actually been infected, but they show no symptoms. And then you have the other end of the spectrum of people who are infected and just do poorly and die. And there's got to be something on the host end, just like Franciscus with your on the host end, where there's something within the body that that has some preconceived idea with either helper T cells or or immunoglobulins that are floating around. And I'm not sure what the situation in Indonesia is, but there's billboards up in the United States encouraging people who have had COVID and recovered from it to go to local academic institutions to donate plasma to see if there's an immunoglobulin or, or cells in that plasma that will aid in, in combating an active illness. So I think all of that ties together uh, in terms of your very elegant talk about uh, GI floor, uh, uh, microbiology and, and how that can impact on uh, uh, wound healing and anastomotic leaks. So uh, just an interesting parallel that I know myself, my colleagues, not only nationally, but internationally, are all still scratching our heads about, you know, what, what, what are we missing on the host end in terms of uh, making someone resistant to this illness or Clostridium difficile or any, any other one for that matter. Thank yes. you, Professor Potwinski. Do you have any comment, Dr. Franz Arifin? If you have any yes. comment? Yes, uh, it is a very uh, interesting pathways and actually some of the researchers is already exploring these pathways because we know that the ACE uh, receptors for the coronavirus is very abundant in the uh, uh, gut. So uh, uh, some of the study shows that even if uh, the uh, respiratory tract has not uh, has uh, not produces the DNA of the SARS-CoV-2. The gut has already produced it because they are replicating in the gut. So, uh, in a sense, uh, the balance of the microbiome may have the roles in uh, this part. We have shown also there is a research shows that. Uh, even if we don't have the immunoglobulin, which is a humoral immunity to the, to, to the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, some of the patient has a cellular immunity by the T cells. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't create a humoral uh, immunoglobulin uh, for the, the infection, uh, some of the, uh, because uh, the T cells are trained in the gut, so they are trained to recognize the virus by the virus itself, but the humoral immunity does not uh, recognize uh, or does not produce immunoglobulins. And this is some research shows that this is already protected, uh, protective enough for the patient from the uh, uh, or, e or even reduce the severity of the uh, uh, disease. 
but this is uh, still hypothetical. We we have uh, we have to have to uh, further study, Professor uh, Podbielski. Well, so, maybe maybe it's time to pay more attention to the role of the gut rather than the lung or the, the circulating <laughs> humoral immunity. It's an opportunity maybe, yes. for you, Franciscus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Doctor Franz. Now yeah. it's your turn. Maybe you have any question to the other speakers. Yes, this is your uh, turn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one question for for Professor Samsu, uh, my my teacher, and Prof Potbielski. One question for uh, Professor Potbielski for Professor Samsu. Uh, the knowledge, the surgical knowledge, is uh, how do you call it? It's uh, uh, advancing and improving. <clears throat> And something that uh, uh, in the in the past we don't know the risk factor for surgery, or we don't know much about the risk factor of surgery. But now we know that some of the characteristic of the patient, such as the gut microbiome, is influencing the outcome. How do we do a, a proper consent to the patient if even the surgeons does not know all, all does not know everything about the patient? This is something that bothers me because uh, it is a time for a personalized surgery, but even now we don't know much about the, the individual patient. So how do we explain? And we, how do we give a informed consent to the patient? And for uh, Professor Potbielski, I like to know if it is a part here, how, how, how can the, the, the bacteria goes that deep? I mean, I, I know that the, in the insertion of the uh, porta cap is uh, directly to the blood, uh, the, to the, uh, sorry, to the subclavian uh, vein, I think. But how, how does the <clears throat> infection shows in the middle of the, uh, the chest rather than uh, patient goes to sepsis first? Uh, so th this, this is something that is uh, uh, interesting for me. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Samsu Dayat, you can respond to Dr. Franz's uh, question. Uh, yes, I will try to do it, but I'm not sure whether my answer will be correct. Surgical knowledge is indeed advancing, but still until today, we do not know how the patient body, which is about to, to have surgery, will respond to the trauma of surgery itself and to any microbe that will come into his body mm -hmm. after surgery. That must be explained to the patient before coming to a, an agreement, a consent. So the patient shall be told that the surgeon is doing anything but cannot guarantee that he will achieve uh, a certain result. He is just doing his best. And you have to explain to the patient, maybe uh, repeatedly, or you cannot reach a consent within one day or two days, if it is not an emergency surgery. But anyhow, informed consent is depending on uh, agreement, of course. Yeah? It's a consensual agreement between the doctor, the surgeon, and the patient. I realize that I'm not knowing anything and that should be transformed or transmitted to the patient. What I can do is just do my best and hopefully the end will be better for you. Uh, in short, I cannot promise any result. I just can do my best effort. That is my... Uh, my conviction from the very start when I start doing surgery to any patient I know of. Uh, does this explain or answer yes. the question? Yes, Prof. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor Samsung Hidayat. Uh, Professor uh, Potbilski, uh, you can respond to Dr. Franz's question. I'll, re I'll respond to my, my senior colleague just with a thought. You know, this whole discussion about how do you really give informed consent to a patient uh, when you start doing robotic surgery and all of these other uh, different types of advanced procedures, 
you know, how do you really have a good discussion with the patient about truly what the risks are? Uh, and maybe you're not doing the safest procedure for the patient, but you're trying to advance scientific knowledge. It becomes an internal ethical quandary that you as a surgeon have to have to come to some resolution in your own mind that the benefit of advancing surgery as a whole may merit a slightly increased risk to your patient. So just, just an observation on that. To get back to Francisco's question though about the, the path of spread from this infection, this goes, speaks again to your uh, comment about uh, gut flora and and immune, immunocompetence in terms of uh, maintaining the health of the individual. Remember this patient was undergoing chemotherapy for mm -hmm. prostate cancer. So after the patient initially had the, uh, had the port put in, they immediately received chemotherapy. So now you have someone who's immunosuppressed that may predispose them to an infection and may predispose them to a, to a somewhat more uncommon pattern of spread mm -hmm. than say perhaps someone who's completely immunocompetent. So my only speculation why you had a, a superficial infection to the uh, area of the sternum rather than a hematogenous infection mm -hmm. is, is one that I've, I can't offer you a, a direct explanation to, but may have something to do with the patient's immunocompromised mm -hmm. uh, status that the pocket was originally drained okay just by taking the port out and packing it, but something in the soft tissue along the pectoral muscle, there may have been some residual infection. And the other... Muted. I miss your voice. Yeah, I think Prof Potpiaski is. Uh, I don't know the maybe connection the is. Man. Yeah, yeah, the connection is uh, unstable. Maybe uh, Professor Potpiaski, <clears throat> are you still online with us? Okay, we will postpone uh, the comment of Professor Potpiaski, and now I will open the discussion for the floor. But for the first, uh, Professor Paul Talile, you have. Uh, any question to the speakers? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, please address your question uh, to which speaker? Professor Samsu Hidayat, my teacher and my senior. Yeah. How are you, Professor Samsu? You healthy? Uh, my question is, what do you think about this... Uh, when a surgeon refused to operate the COVID-19 patient and uh, in ethical aspect, what do you think about that? Because we must uh, uh, focus on our patient safety, especially surgeon safety. What do you think about the, this uh, in, uh, ethical aspect? Yeah, uh, Professor, yeah, Professor Samsui Dayat, uh, you yes. can respond. Yeah. <laughs> yes, this question has been asked to me too many times. Oh, the surgeon, <laughs> the surgeon is going to operate on a, a COVID-19 patient should be convinced that his protective gear protective gear, apa itu? Uh, APD, uh, pelindung diri, what is that? Protective yeah. gear. PPE. Equipment. APD, yes. Yeah. PPE. Is, is indeed guaranteed, sufficiently safe. If not, then the surgeon has the right to remove, to, to refuse doing surgery to a COVID-19 patient. Then the hospital is responsible for providing the correct gear for the surgeon and for everyone around the patient during surgery. Uh, that's my opinion. And I think that I have, as a surgeon, if I have to operate on a COVID positive patient, I will refuse 
doing that surgery if I'm not provided with the correct protective gear. Uh, that is my right, I think, because doing a surgery without any proper protective gear is ridiculous. Uh, it's not proper and I will refuse it, whatever the cause is. Hope I'm correct. Yeah, thank Anyone you very much. Who... Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Samsu Hidayat. Uh, do you have uh, other question, Professor Paul Talele? But the problem is uh, our country is a big country and in the rural area as a surgeon, I think it's difficult to protect ourselves against the COVID uh, patients. What do you think about this one? Because um, talking about the surgeon safety, you must, uh, of course, this is the first time, the first step that's uh, to go ahead to go do the surgery. This the problem is our country is a big country and uh, so many surgeons uh, work in the rural area and the remote area and it be the very limited facilities to protect themselves. I think the point is there. Uh, the hospital should be responsible for providing the proper gear, protective gear. If the hospital cannot do this, then the hospital should transfer the patient to another hospital, not being operated in this hospital with a chance uh, of uh, is it? Manularkan. <laughs> transmission. Transmission. Transmit. Transmit. Transmission to the disease to the to the surgeon. In any case, whatever, the surgeon should refuse to do surgery if he has not enough protective gear. If he is doing that, then it will be a suicide, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's Thank you. my point of view. Thank you, Professor Samsu Hidayat. Uh, Professor hey, Botbilski, uh, Peter, are you still I'm, online? I'm sorry, Peter. I had a, I had okay. a technical I had a technical glitch. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Professor yeah, Paul Talen, do you have do you have a question for Professor Botbilski? Yes. Because you you told me that you will uh, comment Professor from Frenzy. the presentation of Professor Botbilski. Yeah, please, Professor oh, Paul Talen. Are you still healthy? Yeah. Uh, I, here? I'm here. To hear. Uh, can you explain once again about the pathway of the disinfection uh, from the first site in the port area goes to the uh, sternomenibral uh, sites? Can you explain how this infection goes through yeah. uh, the tissues and then to the uh, that area. Yeah, this I, I don't know how where I got cut off uh, when I was talking about that, but this was a, a prostate cancer patient who had been on chemotherapy. And when they put the port in initially, within a week afterwards, the patient received chemotherapy and had gotten a couple other rounds of chemotherapy, so was immunosuppressed. So, you know, generally, if you get a portacath infection and it remains infected, you, you get a local infection right to the subclavian space and it tends not to drain anywhere else. And my only speculation was that when they explanted the porticath, they dealt with the infection that was immediately here. But as you know, when you put a porticath in, you will, you'll dig underneath to make a subcutaneous pocket. And depending on how deep you dig towards the midline to avoid having the port drift into the axilla, they probably explanted the port, dealt with the infection right where the hole was, but didn't necessarily put the packing in and wash out deep into the space where there was residual infection that was still lurking there. And the other interesting point is 
the patient didn't come to presentation until four weeks after the port had been explanted. So it's, they, they did the right thing, they took it out, but I think they underestimated this patient's immunosuppression and debilitated state in terms of a small residual infection that was still potentially in there that had perhaps seeded the pectoral muscle, probably not the bone because they didn't get into the rib, but if you go far enough under the pectoral muscle, as you saw from the lymphatics that, that drain centrally towards the internal thoracic chain, probably whatever infection was there made its way underneath the pectoral muscle along the ribs and perhaps the intercostal vein towards those central lymphatics resulting in this infection. Because the patient had the patient hadn't fallen or you know taken a blow to the chest or had a motor vehicle accident, so there's absolutely zero causative reason why the patient should have developed an infection centrally uh, <laughs> rather than locally from the port pocket. So, thank you, Professor Podbilski. Uh, Another question. I have an additional question to this one. Oh yeah, please, Professor Samsuida. Yes, my next question is: Where is the portal cap exactly? Is it the subclavian artery? A subclavian vein? Subclavian vein. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one question, Peter. One question. Yes, yes, please. Um, I do think is uh, when we use the fact method vacuum uh, acceleration um, uh, treatment for the wound, is that uh, effective for this uh, condition? Well, it's the wound vacs are generally effective for large soft tissue injuries. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you have no concern about osteomyelitis or residual dead tissue, the wound vac is nice because you put it in and the suction tends to draw the wound together to, to close it. But the, the concern I had with trying to use a wound vac to treat this patient was the concern for potential osteomyelitis and residual uh, dead cartilage in the depth of the wound itself. So rather than just open it, wash it out and put a wound vac in and hope that the rest would be well, I really wanted over the course of a week or two to, to go back and debris this wound a couple of times and make sure that there was all of the tissue in there was was living tissue with a vascular supply. Thank you, okay. Professor Thank you very much. Uh, Is there any question from the floor? Thank you, uh, Professor Francis, for your explanation. Yeah. Any question from the floor? Uh, I have a question for Professor Podbilski. Yes, sir. Why um, you didn't put any approximating stitches? Because I saw on your slide, the gap is still wide. So uh, you put also the gauze or the pack. This is the possibility to inhibit the granulation. Uh, do you have an uh, explanation about this? Well, I, if, I, if we would have needed to treat this wound for more than about a, a week and a half or so, such that the wound would have remained open, because, you know, if you don't close the wound within a couple of weeks, what will happen is in an abdominal wound or any wound you had, the edges will tend to just, just start to separate and you end up with a big gaping wound. So one of the things we had discussed, because when we finally did close the wound, we didn't use a wound vac, but we did put a Jackson Pratt drain in on suction to, to try to get the, the wound to collapse on itself. And part of the reason of following this patient in the office every week or two, because if that wound had opened up again and wasn't gonna close, then probably we would have needed to consult our plastic surgery colleagues about doing some type of a pectoral rotation flap with a, with a skin graft on top of it to close the defect. So we, we, we got lucky in, in that respect. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Podbilski. Uh, any question from the floor? Yes, yes, regarding the last 
the remarks of Professor. Yes, yeah. please, Professor. Uh, is that what what we call the uh, wound healing by 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 secondary intention? Is it right? Mm -hmm. Correct. 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 Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Samsui Dayat. Uh, if there is no question anymore, uh, I think we have reached the end of this session. But uh, before closing, there is a two closing speech. The first is from Mr. Max Downham as the world CEO of the International College of Surgeons and will be followed by the speech of the Vice President of Indonesia Section, Dr. Johnny Dharmajaya. For the first opportunity, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Downham to deliver your closing speech. Mr. Downham, uh, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Manopo. Uh, I, I listened to every word of the um, of the presentations, uh, and I, I'm a lay person, so uh, there is a lot I didn't understand. But a, a couple of quick uh, takeaways is that uh, number one, I heard the in the doc, uh, Dr. Sam's presentation, and thank you for allowing me to address you as Dr. Sam. Uh, thank you. That uh, the uh, that it ethics uh, go to trust. And, and trust uh, is uh, going back many years and in, in earlier incarnation in my life is a magical word in the English language and I'm sure other languages as well. Uh, and so the, and that goes to what I've heard uh, Dr. Sam, Dr. Arifin, Dr. Podbielski indicate as personal responsibility. Uh, and the, uh, and Dr. Podbielski's uh, 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 at example of informed consent uh, prior to robotic surgery. And to yours, uh, uh, Professor Tahalehi, about the uh, doing uh, surgery uh, on a person with COVID-19. Um, it seems that um, there is the element of risk and, and, and it's to me as a lay person, uh, what impresses me amongst many things is that all of you, uh, as you've indicated, deal with risk in many ways, and and uh, you are to be, uh, I think, commended for this discussion. I, uh, if I could just reference Dr. Max Thorek quickly, he, uh, he talked about in one of his principles, student, uh, everybody's a student and, and a teacher at the same time, and it seems that on the subject of risk, uh, you can never learn too much and never uh, share too much. So I'm extremely impressed. I thank you again, uh, Dr. Manopo, Paul, Professor Tahalehi, Dr. Arifin, uh, Dr. Hindarto, uh, the other leaders of the Indonesian section. I, I can't say enough about you and commend you enough. Uh, what you are doing is just phenomenal. Uh, I think that uh, it is an absolutely wonderful example that I hope other sections will endorse and practice and implement. Uh, and so it's a privilege uh, for me to, to not only speak, but to listen to um, all of you. I thank you so very, very much uh, and uh, wish you well. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Manopo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dorham, for your closing speech. And now I would like to invite Dr. Johnny Dharmajaya as the organization vice president of ICS Indonesia section. Please, Dr. Johnny. Okay, thank you, Mr. Manopo. Good evening, our honorable speaker this evening, Professor Sam Suhidayat, Professor Tahalele, Prof. Darto, Dr. Arifin. And good morning, especially for our honorable speaker from abroad. Still morning in your country. Good, mo good morning, thank you. Yeah, Professor Podbliski, Professor Sofas, and uh, Mr. Max Donham. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have already heard very interesting presentation and discussion this evening. 
on the other side, we also understand how important the ethics and patient safety concept in our surgical fields. As a doctor, all of us know our motto, first, do no harm. We have to practice this motto in terms of patient safety in our daily activities, especially because in <clears throat> we are facing COVID-19 pandemic now. I just want to remember my colleague like this. When we are talking about patient safety, it also means doctors or surgeon safety as well. So once we ignore this, we are in danger extremely in this pandemic. That's why let me ask all of us to increase our awareness, awareness about patient safety procedure. Finally, I want to address my high appreciation and thanks to our excellent speakers this evening. See you on next event of ICS. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, for Dr. Johnny Dharmajaya, for your closing remarks. Uh, finally, I would like, on behalf of the Indonesian section, uh, the dedication of the good speakers, Professor Podbilski and Professor George Silvas, uh, Mr. Max Thornham, for your participation, and also to my colleagues from Indonesia section, Professor uh, Samsu Hidayat, Dr. Franz Arifin, Prof. Paul Talili, uh, Prof. Hendi Hendarto, Dr. Johnny Dharmajaya, Mr. Birmo Kumular, and uh, Ms. Devi for your participation uh, for the successful of this uh, session. And also, I would like uh, to express my gratitude to our collaborating partners, the Indonesian Medical Association and the Faculty of Medicine uh, Media Mandala Catholic University, Surabaya, and also for the Indonesian Association of the Thoracic, Cardiac, and Vascular Surgeons. We will meet again uh, next month for the next chapter with uh, other speakers. But I hope uh, from the ICS headquarters, uh, Professor Sofas and Mr. Max Downham will routine will address the remarks from the headquarter. Thank you very much again, also for the all participants of the sessions, and we will meet again in the next opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much, you, Professor. Prof. 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 Good night, Indonesia. Next, yeah. Professor, thank you. Professor, Professor so far, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Yeah, thank you very much. Come again, yeah. Professor Pidilski <laughs> to Surabaya. Oh, yeah. <laughs> meet you all next time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Professor, thank you very much from Chicago. Okay, yeah. thank you. Regard, yeah. bye -bye. regard for you all and your families. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Selamat malam semuanya. Nebeng. Selamat malam. Ya, Prof. Sri. Apa kabar, Prof. Sri? Selamat malam. Terima kasih. Selamat malam. Selamat malam, Prof. Samsu. Prof. Paul. Ya, Prof. Paul. Sampai jumpa lagi. Sehat, sehat semua. Bagus sekali. Jaga kesehatan. Ya, betul. Terima kasih. Om Joni, selamat malam semua hey. Maliawan. Hey, Prof Andi, apa Bye. kabar? Oh, <laughs> Saya lihat tadi fotonya, hey. tapi nggak sempat nak <laughs> menyapa. Ya, oke, okay. sehat ya. Ya, Prof Tamsu, sehat-sehat. Siapa? Siapa ini? Prof Andi, Andi Asadul. Andi. Andi. Ketua Ikabi, ah. Ketua Ikabi, Prof. Ya, ya, Makassar. Ah, ya, selamat Makassar. malam. Sehat terus. Alhamdulillah. Oke, selamat malam ini, semua. Salam sudah sehat. Sampai ke Mas Samba itu melihat. Ya. <laughs> sampai Masuk. jumpa. Sampai ya. jumpa. Ada? Sehat. Sampai jumpa. Oke. Okay. Sampai jumpa.